Let's continue talking about the script syllables.py. At the end of the last video, we had just executed this block of code. We had iterated over the word Canada and over the letters C and A to the point that previous consonant is now equal to C and our current car, A, is in fact in the set of vowels. So, we've now added our first string, our first portion of a string, to the variable CV sequence, and we are resetting previous consonant to none. And we'll continue executing this code for the rest of the letters in the word Canada, and in every word we evaluate after Canada. So, why is the code set up this way? Why do we have these if blocks set up in this way? Why can we not just add a C when the character is not in vowels and add a V when the character is in vowels? <coughs> well, the reason is we want to account for the clusters. PH, NG, CK. So here we found a CV sequence and we're comfortable adding a CV sequence to CV sequence because if we have found a vowel we know that we don't have a consonant cluster. Likewise if we have found a vowel and we don't have a consonant we can be comfortable adding the vowel to the CV sequence. If we have a consonant followed by another consonant, then we want to see if that combination, previous consonant along with the current character, which happens to be a consonant, to see if that is in clusters. So this code gets evaluated when we encounter pH as in photon. P, H is in clusters, and so we only add a single C, representing a single consonant sound, to the CV sequence, and then we reset previous consonant. If we have a previous consonant and a current consonant, but they are not together in clusters, then we can add a C to the CV string and then set previous consonant to the new consonant, just in case we have a cluster following another consonant. And then finally, this block often gets often gets executed for the first letter in the word if that letter is a consonant. <coughs> we do have a situation where the previous consonant may be stored but not actually placed into CV sequence inside the for loop. And that's the purpose of this code outside the for loop. If there is a value still being stored at previous consonant, then we can add to the CV sequence a final consonant. This block of code would be run, for example, in the word photon, where the last letter is a consonant which is not part of a cluster. Okay, and then after we have our sequence of C's for consonants and V's for vowels, that sequence is returned as a string to wherever this function was called, get CV sequence. Get CV sequence was called inside of get syllable sequence. <coughs> so syllable sequence, let's say we're working with the word Canada still, the syllable sequence returned from 
or rather the CV sequence returned from get CV sequence for Canada is CV CV CV. The point of the method get syllable sequence is to break a string of C's and V's into syllables for that word. And this is a very simple, not very robust way of doing so. So we are checking for certain patterns and then inserting breaks, syllable breaks, in those certain patterns if we find them. So we know, linguists know, that in English, most of the time if you have a vowel followed by two consonants, that is two consonant sounds, the first consonant is typically the end of the syllable to which vowel belongs, the vowel belongs, and the second consonant begins another syllable. So here we are breaking up vowel consonant consonant into vowel consonant, syllable break, consonant. Likewise, if we have CV, CV, those vowels tend to be the center of two different syllables. And if there is only one consonant, then the syllable break is likely to be between the V and the C, the first V and the second C. So we break up CV, CV into CV, syllable break, CV. So why are these in while loops? <coughs> because these replace statements replaces just a method you can call on any string to replace a part of that string that matches the pattern. These replace statements, these calls to replace, will not replace overlapping instances. So basically we are while looping over each string until we've taken care of all possible instances. It's not very efficient, but it works. Finally, we return the syllable sequence, that is, the string of C's and V's broken up by syllable breaks. So Canada, whereas what was returned from get CV sequence was CA, C, I'm sorry, CV, CV, CV. What is now returned, having been processed by these while loops and replace statements, the string we are returning here is CV dash CV dash CV. So remember, finally, that this syllable string, syllable sequence, is being returned to the call from this print statement inside main. So we're printing the word, a colon and a space, and then the string of consonants and vowels broken up by dashes to represent syllable boundaries. Let's look at the output one more time. So Canada, as we said, is returned as CV dash CV dash CV. Photon is split up into pho, one consonant, one vowel, one consonant represented by the cluster pH, pho and ton. Clicking is split into cl and king, cl and king. Because remember, CL we did not count as a cluster, 
It's more than one sound. Canyon is split into can and yun with the n at the end of the first syllable. Caramel is ca ra mel. So for this very small subset of words, <coughs> we have the sequences that uh, the C, the desirable uh, desired CV sequences produced by syllables dot pi. So let's just quickly review where some of the Python concepts we have been talking about occur inside this script and why they are used there. So the first thing we might say about this script, first thing we might notice is how the code has been broken up into several functions. Get CV sequence, get syllable sequence, and in this way our code is made more readable. We can see down here in main what the ultimate goal is. We want to print the word and its syllable sequence. And then we move to the functions themselves to find the details. We could have made one long function that gets a CV sequence and then breaks it into syllables. And there may be an efficient way to do that here. I wanted to get a couple of functions into the code just to see how multiple functions could work together and how one function could call another function, which is totally fine and good practice. We might notice the use of for, if, and while. We use for whenever we want to iterate over something that is a known quantity. <coughs> or we could say we know how many words are in the list of words down below. And so we know that this loop will iterate a finite number of times, five times. And by the time we know what word is assigned to the variable word, we know how many characters are in that word. So we can iterate once per character over the characters in word. We have, of course, different behaviors different things to assign, different values to assign or append to the CV sequence depending on whether we've seen a consonant or a vowel and whether that consonant is part of a cluster. And so here we've made good use of if, elif, and else to handle all the possible situations we could find ourselves in. And of course we want to make sure that we initialize and that we clean up. And if you're going to return something from a method, it's important to have the return statement. Here we've used a while loop in a situation where we don't know exactly how many of these instances will be found in the string. So, so long as we can find another one, this while loop will continue to execute. So we're using while for an otherwise unknown number of times that we might execute this code. It's worth mentioning also that through use of good commenting, good documentation inside this code, and for each function, we know what the code is meant to do. So we're able to walk away from the code for six months, come back to it, and we won't have to work so hard to remember what's going on in the code at any given time.